Okay, it's my pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, Dr. Brian Jackson. Uh, Brian is a native of North Carolina from Lumberton. He did his undergraduate work in horticulture at NC State University. He did his master's at Auburn, and he did his PhD at Virginia Tech. <coughs> um, Brian falls in the footsteps of some well-known professors at NC State, with Colonel Russell Southall and Dr. Paul Fonts, and now Brian Jackson teaching the ornamental plants classes, plant ID courses, uh, uh, and so that goes through about three generations there uh, when we get there. This is Brian's uh, second lecture. Last year he gave us a Friends of the Arboretum lecture on Biltmore, and that's on the website too, and so you can um, check that one out as well. And tonight, Brian, what is this? Oh <laughs> my, not in our garden. <laughs> You're going to need to come explain this. Oh, okay, please. Okay. You may be very surprised. I think this is on. Should be. All right, good. Uh, it's been way too long, it feels like, since I had the chance a little over a year to, ago to, uh, to give the Biltmore History Lecture that, I, that Ted mentioned. Uh, this is uh, going to be quite different. Uh, hopefully the next hour or so will at least raise some eyebrows in a uh, not too inappropriate way. Uh, I promise you that nothing I will say is not published in books or scientific articles relative to what plants do and what they don't do relative to how to perpetuate the species, okay? So that being said, any inferences you make are on your own, not from myself, all right? Because my boss happens to hear this, all right? Um, a couple of things before we get started. First of all, how can anyone talk about sex without chocolate? <laughs> I'm going to explain this a little bit later. But in case some of you who came in didn't get a chance for some goodies, I will start one on this side. If you like Reese's on this side, you got to wait till it comes around. I'm sorry. There you go. All right, take one, pass them around, and then after after all of this plant sex talk, we're going to end up with the end product, which is fruit and seeds. Some of which this is the most popular product. And this whole myth about sex being related to chocolate, all right? So we'll, we'll hit that at the very, very end and send you away. Um, now, two comments before I get started. Um, first of all, the, the, the NNO did a great job this week of kind of uh, as, a, as a lead into tonight's lecture. And if you happen to see the newspaper from two days ago, it had the title, front, front page, Warmth Loving Plants Find North Carolina Just Bombing. And it was talking about why plants are flowering as early as they are. And primarily the article was centered around this new, newly released 2012 version of the, of the hardiness zone map that the USDA just released. And they were trying to make their claims about global warming. You guys make their claims about global warming. And, and uh, so anyway, it's all talking about plant flowering. So two things about this. One, I showed this to my class. And uh, after about five minutes of explaining that this is a newspaper, many other ones did not know. Um, <laughs> the second thing about this, Bryce Lane and I were sitting in the coffee shop, and we had a, a guy come in, and he sat down next to us at the, at, in the booth, and he said, I knew you guys were horticulture. It must have been a slow day in the news yesterday for them to put a plant on the front page. And he was dead serious. I was insulted. All right? I personally invited him here tonight, and I don't see him. All right? So, nonetheless, I didn't know help. There is a, yeah, there is. There is. Okay. Um, in thinking about tonight, I'm going to go fast paced. It's, it's, it's a little bit of science, it's a little bit of art, it's a little bit of human nature, all kind of thrown in together and to see what happens, all right? And, and thinking of, before we get started, how I was going to sum up some of the topics for tonight, I'm willing to bet that if, if Ted doesn't kick me off the stage now, then I've got a shot for the next hour. But let's, let's see. It's a word probably never before seen. Oh, yes, if you would, please. Get the light. I'm just going to let you read as you go. <laughs> Ooh. What? It's time to 
ever get tested? <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Promise. All right, whatever inferences you're making are your own, not mine. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a unique privilege to one, know a little bit about what goes on in the plant world. Two, to be able to have the opportunity to study it on a daily basis. And three, and, and utmost for me, is to be able to share what little I know with, with, with my students, and they know how much I value that. Um, so, so thinking about this, other than these terms, which we'll hit on a little bit as we, as we go through the night, I was thinking on how to get started tonight. And no, this isn't Bible study, but oh, why not start in the beginning? Genesis. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seeds in it according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw this and it was good. From that point until the early 18th century, it was basically sacrilege for anyone to mutter the fact that plants had sex. They didn't. Why? Because male and female in the Bible were not mentioned until verse 26 about the creation of humans. So it wasn't until the 18th century that this idea and scientists really began to branch out to think that yes, plants have sex too in a different way than humans do, but yet in a very similar way. Now you think about that relative to Carl Linnaeus, who most of you know invented this, this Latin binomial system of, of nomenclature, and he first tried to publish this in back 17 something, mid 1700s, and you can imagine the, the controversy around that because sex did not happen according to these religious theologians. Okay. So we've come a long way since that, all right, since, since the beginning. Now, I was in the greenhouse yesterday working with some of my graduate students and talking about flowering. All right, and by the way, this morning, I, probably, I may shouldn't say this, but that would be the last time I say that phrase tonight. I walked in class this morning, I said, folks, I apologize if I say anything inappropriate today because the sex has been on my mind all night, all day, and I'm going to do it tonight in front of a lot of people, and I don't think they heard anything else. <laughs> flowers, right? It amazes me when I see flowers, especially in this situation. I was potting up some plants with my graduate students, and here are these little tiny plugs, these little tiny seedlings of petunia. And then one of the students asked, well, why are they already flowered? And my initial response was, bondage. And she said, what? I said, they are bound in these little tray packs, bound together, they're stressed. And when a plant is stressed, what does it want to do immediately? Reproduce. Reproduce. It's like the old, you know, the old saying or the old joke, if you're stuck in an elevator and, and, and the world stops and you've got 10 minutes to live and you've got an attractive person next to you, what are you going to spend your last 10 minutes doing? Right? It's, that, it's, that, it's in our minds. It's in our, it's in our DNA to want to reproduce. So sure enough, I talked to them about why this is flowering and that we needed to take these flowers off before we pot these because that plant is going to be stressed if it continues to flower. Okay? A lot of effort, a lot of energy plants put into flowering more so than vegetation. All right? Now, with that being said, this is almost what Raleigh looks like another week or so, if you wish. <laughs> this, of course, is in the Netherlands. But plants exude the greatest amount of energies into reproduction. And the ways in which they do that, and the ways in which they attract pollinators to help them in their cause, is really quite remarkable. It's really quite remarkable. All right? With that being said, you know, I remember as a kid, you know, um, I, I started asking questions about where babies came from and all this, and I've got the birds and the bees talk. I'll never forget it. I'm probably, uh, parents still do that today, and my sister, she, she did that as well. But here's, here's my take, all right? And as, as a relatively young individual, compared to some in this crowd, not so much, um, the energy that plants put into flowering is the exact same thing that we all, at some point in our lives, have done all to attract a mate. All right? Hopefully long term, sometimes not, but that's okay. So what do we do? We go out, we get all dooted up, we get dressed, we, we put on the perfume, the cologne, and we, go, we get social. We get around other people who are in a similar situation, and we dance, and we wiggle around, and we, <coughs> we take in some liquid lubricants to make us feel good, and some, uh, some alcohol, and, and, and we're all in search of the date. All right? 
flowers do the same thing, but yet in a different way. Now, this doesn't stop with the young generation. All right, the lady I bought my house from a year and a half ago, I think she was 68, and she had just gotten swept off her feet, all right, and she went and moved to Florida and got married. All right, so it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. So all about sex, all right? Male parts, all right? We're just going to give a little bit of the basics. Uh, pollen release, all right? We all know that. These things called stamens. Female parts, the receiving end of the deal, and other parts. It's these other parts that really intrigue me a lot, all right? Well, first you have to figure out, well, is it a boy or is it a girl? <laughs> and it's not as easy as, as it may seem sometimes. And you just stick your head in and look. <laughs> it, 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 it actually works sometimes. Not all the times it does. So that's a little, little basic botany here. All right, you've got the main things we'll talk about tonight. All right, the stamen is the male part. We'll talk about why that's important and if size matters. <laughs> yes, uh, size matters, I will not say. All right, here's the fruit. And inside the fruit are the seeds. All right, and the seeds, many of which you are, you are participating or partaking in some of the benefits of, of the cow. All right, the chocolate, we'll talk about the seeds of that later. And then, of course, what I call the billboards. <laughs> flashing advertising, right? The pedals, and then the sequels. Okay, so it's really interesting if you and, all, and many of you in this audience are, are plant enthusiasts. You've been around plants, studied them, loved them, touched them, done other things to them for many, many years, and you've noticed that some of them reveal their parts and flaunt what they've got, if you will, and others kind of keep things a little close to their chest and keep things hidden. All right, same as us in public. All right, so we, right now to give you some examples. All right. Female parts. Well, I love to give this example in class that those silks that get stuck in your teeth are actually pistols. So I was like, you know, dig those you know, sex organs out of your teeth. And see if it really, really straight. You can make money off sex, at least plant sex. Saffron. I can't afford this stuff. All right. I see it on the menu and I keep passing it because it's expensive. Saffron for cooking. All right. Now this figure I'm sure changes, but five thousand bucks a pound for crocus stigmas. Crocus pistols that people are grinding up for food. All right. oh, I've already alluded to this. <coughs> We're switching over from the female parts to the male parts. And a lot of these images I've collected uh, from various books, which I'll share with you by the end of the night. Um, one right on top says, Safe Sex in the Garden. And one of my students just walked up a few minutes ago before the thing, and I said, yeah, I'm still waiting for the unsafe sex in the garden to come out. And he said, wouldn't that be having sex in poison ivy? Oh. <laughs> so I told you, Christian, you see what happens. Right? <laughs> Statement size does matter. It does indeed matter relative to pollinators and relative to plants trying to not self themselves, literally taking their own pollen. So a lot of that we'll, we'll mention tonight about relative to uh, how stamen size actually matters. You see in this passive floor, you've got some very large, very vivacious parts using color, using fragrance, and in the stamens and the pistol. Now, st sticking with the theme of, of stamens and, 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 and pollen, all right, pollen is originating from the male part. How many of you have allergies? You can blame it on the boys. <laughs> Never thought about that? You can blame it on the boys, right? In the spring of the year, you know, if, even if you don't have pollen, Allergies. <laughs> if you don't have allergies, all right, you're washing your car, you're spraying off your house, your deck, you're spraying off something. So I, I act to contend that on the fourth day, God said, let there be create allergies for the people on those on those plants. This is a photo I took. You know, gotta love the iPhone, all right. Uh, walking down Hillsborough Street last spring after a rain, and here comes all the pollen washing down. All right, we're looking at plant semen. That's exactly what it is. All right, not. There's no sugar coating here. That's in that bag of candy on this past not up here. All right? Now, now, if you have never seen pollen at, in, a, in, a, in a, an attractive way, let me take a few minutes and share with you a few of these, these uh, scanning electron uh, microscope images of pollen. There are actually botanists in the world who can identify plants without even looking at a plant. They look at the pollen. All right? check, out, so check out some of these. Every pollen grain of every species is, is different in some extraordinary way. I'd love to have these as art prints. They keep going. Bright colors, shapes. Oh, all pollen. This is what you suck into your nose, right? <laughs> Think about that. Oh, this was kind of interesting. Now, this was, these photos, I just I did not take them. They were from the National Geographic, published a paper back in 2009, and it said, like, the life of sex plants or something like that. 
and they, they took this uh, pollen grain and actually squashed an insect egg on, on, this, uh, on this leaf. So they actually mentioned that. Now this is a new one for me. Pine pollen as a dietary supplement. And I, I hear that, mm, mm, that's the exact same thing I have. There are uh, reliefs dated back hundreds of years that show the importance of, he's got a pine cone here, uh, show the importance of using pine pollen in daily nutrition, all right? Now this is just an example of, of the, of the, uh, of the uh, pollen-bearing male uh, catkins, if you will, on a, on a pine tree, and then I shook it, and then you see, you see the pollen come pouring out, all right? Well, check this out. I'm gonna dig a little research. 200 bioactive natural nutrient minerals and vitamins in one single serving of pine pollen. All right. Now, you do a little digging on Google, which by the way, if you Google in sex in the garden in preparation for a talk, it's, I hope no one ever goes back and looks at my, 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 my cookie collection on my computer, because it's going to look like I'm doing things that I shouldn't. All right. Now, thinking of websites, there's one individual who, has, who believes in this so much he goes out and he illustrates and, and he describes how he goes out to pines, he shakes the pollen, he brings it in, he actually uh, sieves it, right? And he gets pure pine pollen, and then he puts it on his cereal in the morning. Puts it on his cereal. Now it's a dirty job, so I don't think everyone's going to do it. But he's using it as an extreme source of protein. Now, one scientific article did say it was one of the strongest, by concentration, uh, pro natural products of protein that you can get from plants. And it makes sense. Think about what it is. Okay? Think about what it is. Now, going back, we're talking a bit about the male parts, a little bit about the female parts. Now, what happens after the whole fertilization process? The fruit swells. And I'll just use the example of a, of a bell pepper as the overall fruit. All right? And then on the inside there are those ovules which mature into seeds. Okay? So now we're on the same page as far as that's concerned. All right? Parts for advertising. Back to those billboards. Oh. <laughs> and Ted said I grew up near Lumberton, or in Lumberton, I did. All right? If you have no idea where that is, if you've ever driven south of Interstate 95, you start seeing these signs pop up about 30 miles out, and then they're every quarter of a mile until, until you get there. All right? Advertising. Advertising is all it is. What do plants do? Well, let's look at sepals. Sepals, primarily, if you think back to what the parts of the flower are, or this, 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 this envelope on the very outside of the flower that's protective of that flower bud before it opens. Okay, that's all, that's its main function in life. Sometimes, however, the sepals are pigmented, all right, serving as petals, whereas the petals are tiny and inconspicuous, such as the hellebore, all right? Petals, the main advertisers, all they are is billboards. Think of the colors that you can see, the size, the shape of petals, all to attract a mate, hopefully. Bracts. All right, we talked about bracts in, in class, and bracts are these modified leaf-like structures that are always below a flower. And I love telling my class, whoever's in HS201, what's the color of a poinsettia flower? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they listen. There they are. And all these are bracts. And of course, we've got the bracts of, of the dogwood. And then lastly, nectaries. Now, nectaries are very visible on some plants, and that's important for us because it makes the flower look cool. Look at that, I believe you. All right? It makes it look very cool, very different. But for an insect, they have been tuned and trained that, oh, that shape means nectar. And they will go to that flower before they will a flower that does not have these nectaries. Little did they know that sometimes they're just false, right? And they just lure them there. We'll talk about that as well. Sexual orientation. How to avoid incest. It is numerous ways. We'll hit on a few. Bisexual flowers. Even bisexual flowers means they have both male and female parts. Right? They even have mechanisms to not create themselves incest, or not to have incest. All right? Just look at a few examples. All right? Avoiding incest, you've got a begonia. All right? I'll mention begonia in a few minutes. They practice not uh, selfing themselves by relocating their male and female flowers independently, but on the same plant. And that allows for pollination to not occur to that female flower from the male flower on that same plant. Uh, you think about squash, if you've ever tried to grow squash, and this is the illustration at the bottom, it's a very dynamic creature, okay? It's got male flowers, and then it puts out female flowers, and then lastly it puts out a bisexual flower that's got both, all right? All different times of the year, rarely at the exact same time, all right? Now, plants have sex conditions. Now, it's nothing that, um, 
and no one really picks up on that, and that's okay, I'll keep going. <laughs> Segregating sex types. Now we've heard some of these terms before. Monetius and dioecious. Well, I gave you an example of monetius, and that is a begonia as an example. A plant that is, it has male and female flowers on the same plant, just separated. Another great example would be corn. All right, think of the corn tassels as the males, the pistils coming out of the silks in the ear, separated by distance, but on the exact same plant. All right? And then you have what's called dioecious, or dioeci, and that is a group of plants that have completely separate male plants and completely separate female plants, and we talked that there's a lot of good reasons for having only males, or a lot of good reasons for only having females. Right? But the thing is, you've got to have both if you want the boom boom to happen. All right? <laughs> Example, hollies. Hollies are dioecious for the most part. There are some that break that rule. Dioecious. Here you've got the anthers, therefore that's the male plant. And here you've got the pistils, meaning that's the female plant. You need both. Okay? Separated by, by plant. And then, of course, the begonia, these are the stamens. And here's the pistil on the exact same plant. So monoecious, dioecious. That's an immediate way of, of not incesting oneself. Okay, keeping them separate. Now the third way, and when incest or self-pollination is most accurate or most common, is when you have a flower, such as the hibiscus that's got the stamens and the pistil, the male and the female, all packed together in a tiny little space. All right, well how do they avoid, how do they avoid that from happening? Well, they've got some ways, believe it or not, they've got some ways. The first, this term, uh, relatively new to me, and you really have to dive into plant sex biology to get it, but Chandry, Right? Protandry is basically when the boys open before the girls. So you've got a bisexual flower that's got both pistols and stamens. All right? Well, to prevent it from accepting its own pollen, in this case, and this is a day flower, Kamalina, and in, in this case, the first day, the stamens open, release their pollen. The second day, the female opens, and the pistil becomes receptive. So they alternate it by days so that it does not accept its own pollen. This is pretty good stuff. Now, not to be sexist here, they do actually do, do Plants do have a protogeny, and this is where the female opens first. The, the pistils come out, they're receptive to pollen, and then the next day or later that day or next week, the male stamens come out and release their pollen. So by doing this, magnolias are an excellent example of how that happens. So by doing this, it, it increases the chances of accepting foreign pollen from other plants of the same species. Okay? What if the pollen from the, stigma, uh, from the stamens and the stigma open at the exact same time. And that happens. Well, some plants know chemically when their pollen lands on their stigma and they refuse to accept it. A chemical hormone kicks into place, or hormone kicks into place, and they refuse to accept their own pollen. All right? So even if they open at the same time, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to uh, pollinate themselves. That's pretty cool. Now, anybody recognize this plant? Violet, yeah, this is viola, one of our native viola species. A lot of, a lot of uh, uh, non-native as well as, as native. And this is a plant that will undergo, uh, it hedges its beds, if you will. Okay, it hedges its beds. It has a very, very specific, unusual way of producing flowers without pollination <coughs> and allowing flowers to be open for the chance of a pollinator to come by. Okay. Now, how do you do that? Here's the plant up close. These are the beautiful flowers. If you look at the inside, they have male parts, they have female parts, and they're all active, they're all viable, they're all ready to go. All right? Here we go. But then they have this other thing, all right? Cleistogamous. Oh my goodness, where do they get these names? Cleistogamous flower. They have flowers. Let me show you a picture. If you've ever pulled up a viola, pulled up one of those little violets, they have these flowers below, which are encased inside of that sepal that protects it, and they never open. They never open. But the stigma and the stamen on the inside, the male and the female, become active, they pollinate, fertilization occurs, and seed are actually set. All right? But if the flowers on the outside did get pollinated, they will abort these and not use them for the next year. All, right? All about perpetuation of the species if there's no pollinators to actually do the dirty work. Okay? So some can do both. That's, that's a really neat. Right, there's an example of those seeds. You have to break them open and then see the viable seeds on the inside. Right? Inbreeding. That's, the, that's what incest would be, is, is, is inbreeding. Now there are some, you know, think of inbreeding, this is a perfect flower. It's got a male and female parts, and they're both acceptable or open at the same time. And they can, some plants are, are able to take that. Right? Then you've got a plant that's got different sex flowers on it, and they can actually pollinate each other in the same plant. Either way, it's, it's, it's inbreeding. 
Um, now, inbreeding is not all bad. All right. Uh, for example, inbreeding will secure a genotype. All right. The genotype of that plant by inbreeding it secures that. Plant breeders actually like plants that inbreed because the, 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 the genes, if you will, have been secured. They, they haven't been tainted by all this foreign pollen. Another thing about inbreeding, uh, maybe there's not pollinators around. Maybe it's a drought. Maybe the plant is stressed. This will perpetuate the species and not rely on someone else. So it's not always bad. Now, outbreeding is the crossing of pollen between plants, all right? cross-pollination. Now, this is good because it increases the genetic diversity. Exactly right. All right? Increases genetic diversity. So this is what most people want. And some of those examples I just went through are all about trying to allow the plant an opportunity to outcross with another source of pollen instead of its own. All right? Now, <clears throat> plants actually have several features, if you look at them, that can give you an idea of whether they are more inclined to self-pollinate or whether they're more inclined to accept pollen from others. All right? And think about it, and it makes sense. Plants that want to, or need to, or have to be bred by others, except for pollen from other plants, they're usually self-incompatible. Like that, that chemical inhibitor I told you that will not let it accept its own pollen. It picks it. Many more flowers, large flowers, bright colors, nectar is present. Ooh, get the insects in. Scented flowers, anthers are close, right, tied in close, and a lot of pollen. Now compare that to plants that often are self-compatible and can, can inbreed, if you will, and everything's basically the exact reverse. So even if you do not know or have an idea, you can just look at the plant parts and they, and they provide clues as to how that plant actually is pollinated. Very interesting. Sexual conditions. Now we've talked about sexual orientation among plants, now sexual conditions within individual flowers. Bisexual, if you pick up a buck, it will likely say, it doesn't matter which book it is, about plant material, it's going to, under flowers, it's going to usually say the first thing, perfect or imperfect, complete or incomplete, or it's going to say bisexual, hermaphroditic, all right? Any of those terms all mean that both the female and the male parts exist on that flower, okay? So that's the first situation, a hermaphroditic or a bisexual flower. Another example, all right, a pistolate flower only has pistols, no boys. Boys are kicked out. No boys allowed. Reverse of that, all boys, all the females are kicked out. Okay? Plants, and many of you may, may be aware of this. Now these individuals can be on the same plant, different plant, it doesn't matter, but it's a different sex parts. Now, sexual orientation, sex conditions, and now here comes the polygamy. Plants can't be happy with just one way of doing things. Sound familiar? Don't answer that question. <laughs> Polygamomonitious. Oh, Poly meaning many, all right? Monitious, oh, we know that term. Monitious is when you have one plant that's got male and female plants separated on that plant, okay? As an example, Asculus, all of our buckeyes, they, they undergo this. Gymnocletus, one of my favorite trees, the Kentucky, Kentucky coffee tree. All right, let's look at this illustration. This, of course, is a male flower, male flower, female flower. Whoops, here comes a bisexual flower, right? In the middle. <laughs> bisexual flower. Now, what, what does that do? Well, this particular plant right here can actually accept pollen and deliver pollen, whereas this can only deliver and this can only accept. So it increases its chances of, of potentially producing more fruit, more seeds. All right? Polygamomonitious. Then you've got polygamodiaceous. These big terms. <clears throat> Dioecious, male plant, female plant, hollies. Think about hollies. All right. Each plant. Let's use my example here. All these are males. All these are females. But oops, one flower is bisexual on each plant. Now it can be more than one flower. This is just an illustration. And this is a color. I like color. I got to have bright colors. And this basically illustrates the same thing. Most ilex species, or many of them, will do this. And in class, just today or, or last lab, it may have been. I showed them a male American holly, all right? This male plant I've been watching for many years, and I know it's male, I've looked at the flowers, but occasionally I'll look and bam, there's a red fruit. And, <coughs> and, and this is exactly what happens. Occasionally a bisexual flower kicks in. Now, to bring it home to sex in this garden, <coughs> take a look back, Chiananthus. Our Chiananthus retusus, the Chinese fringe tree, uh, right here near the elm circle here in the arboretum, um, Back in 2008, and this came from a conversation I had with Denny Warner, all right, so I'll give him credit for this. 
In 2008, uh, this plant produced a copious amount of fruit. All right? and, and Denny was telling me that a lot of people were asking him why, because we know it to be a male, and we know that it has never really set fruit before. All right? and, and Denny, being the great scientist he is, and the geneticist and plant breeder, he, he, he put together a very, very logical explanation. And he said that Kyanethus, being polygamodioecious, male plant, female plant, sometimes they have one or the other on the plant, he said, well, think back, 2007, the summer, all right, the year before is when most plants set their flower buds for the next year. You with me? Especially on a plant that flowers early, early spring. Well, think back to the summer of 2007, and it was dry. Dry and hot. Guess what that plant did? It set more female or bisexual flowers on that male plant than it ever had before. So the next year, bam, fruit, perpetuation of the species. All due to stress, all due to drought stress. That's pretty phenomenal, all right? And then since then, the amount of fruit has since, you know, weighed off and it's not nearly what it was. One slight example, based on an environmental stimuli. Oh, it keeps going. Triaceous. Let's look at this. Fraxins, you gotta love the ashes, all right? All right, oh, male, 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 male. Female, 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 female. And then they'll just pop up a plant that's got some bisexual flow thrown in there, all right? Just for, just for kicks and giggles, I guess. All, right. all these different sex types, all going on. The birds, the bees, and STDs. All right. Um, I never knew this until recently, I'll be honest, that plants do, in fact, some at least, will transmit sexually transmitted diseases. Anybody know that? Where are the hands? You're supposed to be the smart ones, right? Now this is, this is Selena alba. All right? This is actually an exotic plant. Um, and this is one that uh, grows natively along, especially in the mountains. I saw it when I was at Virginia Tech, uh, up in the mountains of Virginia. Grows along the roadsides, all right? Well, the neat thing about this pretty little herbaceous plant, beautiful white flowers, is that it often gets a, a sooty mold, all right? This fungus that attacks it. And what that fungus does is it comes in and it replaces, it attacks the, those stamens, the, the male part with the, with the pollen, and it actually changes it so that the plant does not produce pollen, instead produces fungal spores to spread its fungus. And then, the little busy bee pops by, there's up close to the flower, the little bee pops by, grabs that fungal spore, goes to the next plant, and he has transmitted a disease that cannot be shaped. It cannot be get, gotten rid of unless you come in and emasculate or castrate that flower, take the male parts off, all right? That's pretty intense, but this is what it looks like. This is that, here's the uh, species of that particular sooty mold, and it will basically destroy the flower because they cannot reproduce, all right? So it will actually kill large population by that sexually transmitted disease. Now, there's no test for this, unfortunately. <laughs> now, those who are really, really precautious about STDs and other things tend to, you know, abstain from things. That's, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing, all right? Um, some plants don't even do sex at all. Not in the traditional sense of pollen and stuff <coughs> and little, you know, the birds and the bee thing. Instead, reproduction without sex. This is just a wild garden garlic. Most of you have probably seen it popped up. Now this garlic will actually produce these little bulbils, all right, these little bulbils, which are vegetative reproductions of itself. All right, and then those things will fall off and then actually you know, propagate next year. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but eh, whatever. Okay. <laughs> duckweed. Anybody know duckweed? Oh, yeah. I bet you do. All it takes is you've got a pretty lake or a pond. All it takes is one duck to fly in with one on its foot, and then you'll have a whole population for yourself. Well, it divides without having sex at all, completely <laughs> taking over everything. Nah, don't want to do it. Have you ever heard this term before, doctrine of signatures? Oh, yeah. Now, how could I not, and Ted did me a great favor with that introduction he made, one about the Biltmore experience here, and two about my predecessor, Paul Fonts. Um, Paul Fonts, I love him dearly. He's a great, great man and a great taxonomist. Well, one thing, that one of his specialties, he was one of the world experts on a flower that we know as, as a vine, and it's clitoric, all right? Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out how taxonomists many, many years ago came up with the genus 
name for this plant. <laughs> it also did not take long for Native Americans in, in, in South America and, and, and hot, humid regions of the world where this is native to realize, oh, well, you know, certain plant parts that resemble certain body parts are supposed to help things. All right. Well, this was actually used all right, for females who have pro uh, problems uh, bearing children. All right, they ground it up and they did something with it. It's supposed to either cure or help with infertility or help having children. I have no idea why they thought that. Now, in other words, there are, I'm not, no, don't you dare say a word, all right? At least I, I can't, you can't see if I'm blushing, so it doesn't matter. Plant Viagra. There are plant, there are um, um, helpful instruments that are derived simply from plant-derived parts. And that kind of ties into that whole doctrine of signatures, that this plant that looks just like the female reproductive structure is supposed to aid in helping that. All right? So I don't know what some of the other ones are, but they do sell this. It's new, apparently. All right? <laughs> Attracting a mate. All that being said, you got different flowers doing different things to each other and to themselves, all to perpetuate the species. All right? And I talked a little bit about the amount of energy and effort that a plant will put in to making that flower. It puts it above vegetative growth, it puts it above everything else. All about the flower. Well, attracting a mate. These two photos tell the exact same story. <laughs> exact same story. When you've got a large group of, of people and a large group of plants, all right, and it's reproduction time, whatever signal goes off, it's time, all right? Well, how does this flower compete with this flower and this flower and this flower all for the attention of a bumblebee? Or you get the point of it. <laughs> but what do, you, what do you have to do? You have to make yourself stand out. You gotta do something different. Oh. <laughs> you gotta do something different. All right? Yeah. How do we do that? Well, well that could be a whole other lecture in and of itself. Advertise your goods, all right? This is, uh, you know, we've all seen this before. The same as that south of the border, um, billboard just screaming at you, advertising, advertising, advertising. That's exactly what, what we do as well. All right? Now, it could be on the cover of magazines, it could be in comic strips, whatever it is, people are trying to sell what they got, hoping somebody wants it, they want it, please. All right? How to attract attention in a very competitive field? Well, let's look at the animal kingdom. What did they do? I mean, I, I love National Geographic and the History Channel and all those channels that show some amazing things. And it's all about animals strutting their stuff all looking for a mate. You've been there. You're, there's memories going through your mind, I know it. Look at, you look at this. No baboon, whether it's his butt or his face, everything's blown out there. It doesn't matter if he's coming or going, somebody's looking. Oh, look at this. Tim asked if this is photo, or Chris asked if this is Photoshop. I don't know, I don't care. Whatever it is we do, think about it in all realistic terms. We do the same thing. We do the same thing. All right. A few things that plants do. We'll back off of that before we go too far. The ultimate advertising campaign for plants. All right. Let's talk about a little bit about color. What do they do in regards to attracting certain pollinators based on color? Scents, shapes, oops, size matters. Landing platform. The age-old question. Ooh. I'll keep you on your seat for that one. Hairy flowers. Hair and air. I don't know. Sex through the seasons. All of these things are different. Let's take a look. Advertising with color. Now this is probably not a mystery to many of you or most of you, that how we perceive the wavelengths of color or light and, and we see color differently than how insects and birds see it. Okay? And and you know, this impacts what we plant in our garden. If we want to get hummingbirds, we're going to plant something that's got what color flowers? Okay. Red. Typically with a flower that's got a long tubular nature to it. Alright? Ah, well it fits what he needs. Okay? Well, let's look at this. Here's how we perceive color. Here's how bees perceive color. Notice they don't see much of the yellows. Okay, they don't see the green. All right, here's hummingbirds. <laughs> no wonder they like red. Look at that. And then beetles. <laughs> they don't care. <laughs> they just don't care. If it's there, they'll, they'll, they'll take advantage of it. Light spectrum of pollinators. And again, here's honeybees down in this area. All right, hummingbirds down in this area. And here we are here. We see all this broad range of spectrum of colors uh, it, that plants give off. But <coughs> honeybees are going to be more attracted to the blues and yellows, whereas the hummingbirds, eh, not so much. Okay, talk about choosing plants for its desire for your desired uh, uh, insect choice or, or bird choice. Now, color. 
All right? Color for a, for a, for a bird or for <coughs> a bee that sees red is just like, in our world, a stop sign. Red means stop. All right? Red for an insect means, oh, here it is. All right? Oh, here's, here's a little flock. What are these little things called? Eye spots. What are, what are eye spots? Are they there for our benefit? No. What? Yeah. It's basically saying, here I am. <laughs> it's a target. Some things need help. Target, right there. That's all it is. It's colors. All right? Because imagine this. A, a bumblebee cannot see the white. Remember that I just said whites and yellows they cannot see? But they see the red. <laughs> There's the goods right there. That's amazing. That's amazing. Freckles. Uh -huh. Ever thought about this? Whether it be lilies, whether it be a hellebores, whether it be azaleas, they have these, these on the dorsal part often are freckles. All right? It's, it's, it's honing mechanisms. And not just freckles. Notice this, ladies and gentlemen. See how they're big at the top and then they get smaller and smaller and smaller? You're getting closer. You're getting closer. I love this. They keep going. You're getting closer. It's all about the sun. It's all about watching the sun. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> Changing color after sex. Let's look at the photo. Red hot photo. All right. What a wonderful, wonderful for your plant. Red means, in this case, the NC State logo. Red means go. All right. Red means go. When it's yellow, the embers of that fire are glowing. It's, it's gone. All right. Don't even worry about going there. Oh, my favorite example. Favorite example. Japanese honeysuckle, Lanistra japonica. All right. Growing up as a kid, I, there was a, a large pasture where we had goats and cows and stuff. And on the, on the outside of this pasture was a hedgerow, all right, multiple rows. And all that multiple rows was just tons and tons of Japanese honeysuckle. And in the spring and the summer, I spent a lot of time with my dad outdoors. And uh, he, when, I remember, I don't know how old I was, but I remember when I was first introduced to the honeysuckle. <coughs> and how to, to break it off and you, you suck a little bead of nectar that's out of the back. It's, it's sweet. If you've never done it, you need to do it, okay? And I remember very clearly, I went to grab... <coughs> We were grabbing something. I went to grab a yellow one. He said, no, 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 no. Don't waste your time. He said, there, there's nothing there for you. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, the, the nectar's already, already been taken out. And I said, well, why did you change colors? He said, well, uh, sometimes after, after you know, things have happened, you get sleepy and go to sleep. <laughs> and I said, true story. And I said, that's what you mean go to sleep. He said, son, one day you'll understand. <laughs> what does that do? It tells those wonderful insects, eh, nothing here for you. And it allows the plant to allow insects to focus on those who have not yet been pollinated. Eh, I'm asleep. I'm tired. Leave me alone. Now, how does that translate? And I've, I've seen this in, in, in literature, right? How does that ch translate to something that we as humans often will uh, put into our practice and our traditions, right? Now, think about that. No, I'm not making any insinuations other than this is a readily known, you know, pure white means virginity. Anything other than that, it's not pure white. Eli, say. <laughs> Advertising with sense. All right? My burner. Oh, my goodness. You know, it's about that time, the way things are going. Here's, here's Syringa, the, the lilac. All right? All of these beautiful, wonderful, fragrant scents. Certain insects can, can smell scents where others can't, just like certain insects can see color and other insects cannot, all right? And we all know the answer to this question, but for some of, some of you may not. All flowers don't smell good, all right? All flowers don't smell good. Some of you know this character. Bradford Pear, all right? Now, I love teaching my intro class, and there's several of you here, so you'll get a little forewarning. The intro, HS201, out of 90 students, about 10 are in science related fields, the other the other 80 plus are, are engineers and chass members and people who make me really look dumb because they're really, really, really smart. So they come in and at least I feel like I can teach them something. And I love to take them on a little field trip when, when the platinias are in full bloom, the pyracanthas are in full bloom, the Bradford pears are in full bloom, and I get them all hyped up and then I just stick it in someone's face and I watch their nose, I, I listen to their nose hairs curl. <laughs> it's bad. It's bad, right? Skunk cabbage, same thing. Skunk cabbage. This is uh, a unique inflorescence, the spadix from the spade. 
and it actually <coughs> send, send, sends out scents that are very attractive to beetles and to house flies, similar to what the bread repair will do. And we all know this one. I've had the chance in my life to see an amorphophallus, which literally means shapeless male genitalia. <laughs> <laughs> of what animal I don't know or care to know about, but this is in full flower. I've smelled it twice. Once at Virginia Tech's campus in the conservatory when I was there, and once at Kew Gardens back in 2007. And it truly, it, the, the mask is needed. It's bad. It's bad. Okay, but, but quite as bad. Access to light is the great problem here. Those plants that can command the surface can rule the lake. And none does so on a greater scale and more aggressively than this. The giant Amazon water lily. Its gigantic leaves are armoured with spines that protect them against any fish that might try to make a meal of them. Their huge expanse is kept outstretched and floating on the surface by a lattice of buoyant air-filled struts. The crinkles in the surface swiftly flatten out as the leaf expands to its full size. The edges are turned up so that the leaf can shoulder aside any competition. Fully grown, a single leaf is six feet across. Virtually no other plants can live in the black shaded water beneath these leaves. They cover the surface so completely and the support of their air-filled girders is so effective that birds, most famously the lily trotter, can spend their entire lives walking around on them, collecting insects. The giant lily's flowers are on an equally monumental scale. They're about a foot across. The life of any one bloom is short. It opens in the evening and gives off a strong perfume. During the night it closes and it stays closed for the whole of the next day, slowly flushing pink. On its second evening it opens again. Then it closes for the last time. Why does it behave in this extraordinary way? It's a neat way of avoiding any chance of being fertilized by its own pollen. The perfume it produces on its first evening attracts beetles. They bring with them pollen from other lilies, so this flower is about to be fertilized. But then the lily closes its petals. The beetles will be held captive inside for 24 hours. The following evening, the beautiful prison opens its gates and the inmates are free to go. The flower has showered the beetles with its own pollen during their long stay. Now red and odorless, the flower is no longer attractive to beetles, so they'll go in search of white flowers on another plant, carrying the pollen and bringing about cross-fertilization. Its mission completed, the flower withdraws back to its watery world. The name of that bird is the 
Carol does a much better job than I could in explaining one of the neat things that just one particular plant. And if you've ever seen one of these Amazon lilies up close, they are literally white. All right, advertising with shapes. All right, I kind of already mentioned that hummingbirds, for example, love long tubular flowers. That allows them to put that long beak and even longer tongue down in to the, to the bottom and hopefully draw nectar. Same thing with butterflies. They have that long, as, as Bryce Lane always says, round up garden hose, all right? This proboscis, this long tongue that goes down. So, so butterflies um, uh, and hummingbirds love long tubular flowers. The more the merrier, all right? Do you go out by yourself? No, you always go with friends. Flowers do the same thing. The more the merrier. Right? Tiny little flowers look insignificant by themselves. Pack, to, pack them together on a big, tall inflorescence, and bam, honey, here I am. All right? <laughs> Out there. Landing platforms. All right? A lot of orchids will have this. All right? Here's one snapdragon. They'll have it. Landing platforms on Lamiaceae. All right? These bilabiate shaped flowers on the Lamiaceae family. I'm just talking about this today in life. All right? Somehow, sometimes things just work together really well. All right? And the, and the interesting, and, and, oh, I can actually do this. All right? Now, look at this guy right here. After a long day of buzzing around in midair trying, trying to feed his, his, his you know, fill his belly, if you will, all right? So see this landing pad is a pretty neat thing, all right? Oh, I can sit while I eat, all right? Pull up a chair at the buffet. But what he's doing, he's, he sends his, his, his head and his tongue down into the throat, right here. Whoop. But guess what? The sex organs are up here. So, bumblebee, sex organs. The weight of the bumblebee, as it lands on the bottom pad, whoop, slaps him in the back of the head. There it is, right there. Flies on, just like that beetle coming out of the water lily to the next plant, and slaps him on the back of the head. Pollination occurs. Okay? Pollination occurs. The age-old question. Whether to conceal... Where, where are the sex parts on this snapdragon? I don't know. They're hidden. Or revealed. <laughs> Look at that. Out in full force. I'm going to show you what I got. All right? Ever thought about that? Let's take a look. This one, obviously, the hibiscus, it throws it out there well above the flowers. This is revealing. All right? The sneaky little snapdragon. I love this illustration in class as well. Um, watching a, a snapdragon get pollinated is, is an event you should plan your day around sometime in the summer. I am very serious. If you've ever taken a snapdragon, it's got an upper lip and a lower lip, and they're very tight. They're, they're together, all right? And a little old mite, a little old tiny bee, does not have the strength it takes to pry those lips apart and to get in where the pollen is, okay? So it takes usually a big critter, all right? Let's take the example of the bumblebee. You see his butt sticking up. He's already made entrance. Well, let's, let's take it from the beginning, all right? Bumblebee flies in. Oh, bright colors, all right? Going in the center. Oh, finding the opening, upside down. Prying the lips open, upside down. In at last. He squeezes himself in. The lips are continuing to main, maintain pressure around him, not to allow anything else in. And then he gets what he wants. And the flower gets what he wants. Now, all insects do not have that strength. So some cheat. I took one of my labs right here near, near the necessary last uh, last fall and we watched this beautiful salvia all right in full bloom i forget the cultivar i excuse me all right um and we watched the swarm of bees anybody in here from my class watching the bees? oh yeah hands going up and we, i said just watch them guys just watch them they're all cheaters they're all cheaters and were they going in the top of the salvia nope they were all drilling into the base to suck the sap out because they knew they couldn't get through that narrow tube of that salvia and they still found the way Life finds a way. We cheat sometimes too. Hairy flowers, right? Um, the bearded iris is a good example, all right? Here you've got sundew. <coughs> uh, these these hair, what appears to be hairs on the outside, of course, bearded iris. A lot of bumblebees, all right? Think about a bumblebee versus a carpenter bee. The main difference is hair or no hair, okay? Well, to some, that looks like a fellow mate. Sex through the seasons, all right? Think about the spring. Oh, there's the saffron. You better run out and start collecting. The summer. Oh, there's the plant that the pistol's open first and the stamen's open last and it doesn't sell itself. We've learned so much already. Here's the fall, osmanthus. All right, Halloween comes and you're, you're getting to walk around with your kids and you're smelling osmanthus. Wonderful thing. Completely different times of the year. And then now, here's the, uh, the uh, Lenistra fragrantissima that I have now indoctrinated my students with. But this plant smells like none other than what? The 
Fruit Loops. And uh, <laughs> try it, I promise you. <laughs> now, why, why is this? Now, this is not unintentional. There are different insects, different pollinators, around at different times of the year. All right? And plants have evolved, and they, and they do their thing, and they can get the pollinator of their choice. Oh, great bribes. All right? Nectar. We talked a little bit about nectaries, and that nectaries will offer sometimes nectar, sometimes it will not offer nectar. <laughs> Pollen, all the, the insects dragging away the pollen, or the guys who want to actually eat the pollen as a, as, a, as a protein supplement, and then other rewards that plants will bribe insects into, into doing. Uh, peanut butter is not one of them. Nectar, we talked about nectar and the plants that have these nectaries that often will store nectar, are chosen over plants that do not have them simply by the perception that, oh, there's nectar there to be had. Pollen, look at this. Ever seen this up close? And they, he's loaded and ready for action. Right? And he keeps going. He keeps going. Other rewards. Now this one may be a little far stretched, but it's really true, especially for some insects. What does a flower offer an insect other than food to make him want to come? The company of others. It's a sex brand for insects. Right? See if you've ever caught butterflies. They do it differently. Oh, I hate those things. They're latched in. They're, something's going on there. He's really latched in. <laughs> oh my goodness. Celosia, you get coxcomb, and you can't beat the, the uh, lightning bugs off of them. All right? Why are they there? More so for each other, it's a place to meet. That's the pub. And it's, that's the pub. <coughs> Pain and shame. Okay? We could also go here, but we won't. Eating the victims. Oh, Seymour. Right? Feed me, feed me, feed me. Fraudulent advertisers. You've been pumped. All right? It's a very interesting way. Let's take a look. All right? Whether you're looking at the you know, pitcher plant, erosema, where you're looking at you know, some of the sundews, insects fly in thinking they're going to get something, uh, thinking they're going to get water, for example. It looks like water, but it's really a sticky sap that sucks the insect in and digests him for the protein. All right? And as an example, there's an insect. We thought this was water. He's going in for a little sip. Well, he got a sip all right. Fraudulent advertisers. You know, orchids are the absolute best at this. Okay, these orchid flower. If you didn't know better, I mean, if I was going in and to touch it, I would, I would draw back really quickly. I would think it was an insect. All right, I would think it was an insect. Orphis insectifera. Now notice the name. Notice the specific epithet, which is an adjective to describe the genus. Insect attracting orchid is basically what it said. Look at this. Isn't this so cool? He's even got sunglasses. They didn't put eyes on it. Look at this. I mean, who, I understand why. Now, everyone thinks the name of this bee, the duped bee. Literally, that's his name. He's been duped. The duped bee. They thought, scientists thought for a long time the insects that came to these fraudulent flowers that were advertising goods they did not have, the insects were getting nothing out of. Well, recent science has proven otherwise. And here's this duped bee again. <laughs> this species of Australian tongue orchid can be just as alluring as a female. Male orchid dupe wasps are tricked by the flower's sweet perfume and dive into it. They're drawn to the base of the orchid and position their abdomen right next to the source of pollen. The male then starts to mate enthusiastically with the flower and about 75% of the time, he will ejaculate. Researchers from Macquarie University took samples of the sticky substance that was left behind. Using a microscope, they confirmed that they were indeed a wasp's sperm cells. After the liaison, the wasp tidies himself up. He stumbles away carrying a delivery for the flower, a bright yellow bundle of pollen attached to his abdomen. The next time he's fooled into sleeping with an orchid, he will inadvertently pollinate the flower. Sexually deceptive orchids that cause insects to ejaculate have the highest rate of pollination. What they didn't show is it went off to take a nap. Alright. We're getting, we're, I'm wrapping up, we're getting Alright. A few of the nature's pimps, as I like to call them. All right? I'll, I'll give really briefly an example of how these particular insects or animals uh, serve our, our plant world in, in aiding in pollination. Bees do it. Butterflies fluttering about. Moths, all right, in the evenings, an enchanting moth. Flies scraping the bottom, taking the unwanted 
Uh, the old reliable beetles who just don't care. If it's there, I'll take it. Ants, potential pain, sex for the birds. Uh, bats doing it in the dark and blown away by the wind. Right, let's take a look at bees. So we, we all know bees. Bees are the number one uh, insect for pollinating crops. If it wasn't for bees, you know, we would not eat. All right? the, the world would literally stop. Oh. Butterflies. Butterflies are a good one. Remember, needing long, tubular type flowers that can send their wound up garden hose down into to suck out the good of the flower. Moths. All right? Moths, many of them mimic themselves, bees, so they don't get eaten by other birds. All right? Well, this is an interesting, this is Mirabilis, Mirabilis Jalapa, the four o'clock. This is a photo that Denny Warner took last summer and shared it with me. He's quite the photographer, whether you know it or not. So that's a fascinating moth in the evening, pollinating the uh, Mirabilis Jalapa. Flies, taking the unwanted, okay? It's, it's oftentimes those putrid smelling, rotten, carrion flowers that's attracting beetles and flies. All right, there's the beetles. See a lot of beetles. Think about sedum, right? The Arctic joy or any other type of sedum in the fall of the year. Beetles just covering as well as other insects. Oh, I love that. King of this castle. Mm -hmm. All right? <laughs> State your claim and claim your prize. That's the truth for anything like it. Uh, ants do a lot of things. I see a lot of ants on cow meal out of folia, the mountain laurel. Cow meal out of folia. And if you ever think about it or if you ever touch the flower of cow meal, these little saucer shaped flowers, and they're sticky. And it's really, really sweet. It's just like the honeydew they're used to gathering up from the aphids, right? Ants love to cover pollen or to cover cow meal. <coughs> Sex is for the birds. Oh, imagine that. Red, tubular, there's a hummingbird. And there's not much left for this party. Red means goes. So there's only a few flowers left for that hummingbird. Red, tubular, all about birds. Bats doing it in the dark, Datura or Bermenzi are often done by large balls or even bats in the, in the winter or in the, uh, in the nighttime, yeah, that thing. Oh, <laughs> imagine pulling this out of, out, of, out of your flower pot in the morning, that's not be good. All right? Um, blown by the wind. A lot of plants are wind pollinated, especially those that are either compatible or self incompatible with their own pollen. It doesn't really matter if there are insects around, it doesn't matter. As long as the wind's blowing, they can perpetuate their species. Of course, human intervention, we, our department here at NC State is, is one of the, if not the best plant breeding department in the country, if not the world, certainly for ornamental plants, but also for agronomic crops. And that's something we hang our hat on very, very, very proudly. And this arboretum exhibits a lot of the efforts that have come out of that program of projects. So plant breeding, we, we certainly have a hand in, in developing new and, and perpetuating species of some, some plants. So, so remember, plant sex can be complicated all right, methodical, calculated, <coughs> deceitful, all right, but not as deceitful as we once thought it was, at least the, the, the little wasp gets something out of it. Competitive, intense, rewarding, erotic, tiresome, and just plain cool, all right? Now, when the fun is over, all right, remember I said this at the very beginning, once <coughs> all the hoopla is over and it's all done, the lights will turn out, the end result is a flowers, the end result is a fruit. Right? I couldn't help but see. <laughs> yeah. What do I do with this thing now? I've got it. Right? Okay. Well, fruit and seeds. Okay, now anybody recognize this? This is cacao. This is what chocolate is made from. Cacao. Now, I I'll give a lecture to uh, my HS201 class a little bit later. Any of you are welcome to attend. But we will literally just eat chocolate till we cannot eat chocolate anymore. And we'll talk about how cacao is made and the impact that it's made, or how chocolate is made from these, from these seeds. Now, the reason I passed that chocolate around is one, is that kind of hedged my bets, just like the plants have been doing to, to foster their pollinators. That's, the chocolate was hedging my bets that you would get in this nice, lovely, euphoric state of mind, and that you would give me really good reviews for this. <laughs> I don't know if it worked or not, but, but you know, people associate chocolate, just as a aside from plant sex, with, with, with sex. Okay. Well, just in case you've never known or never done a lot of research, chocolate contain it is not an aphrodisiac, okay? but in a certain roundabout way it does facilitate things. And by that it contains several compounds, several chemicals. One's caffeine. I know in the mornings I drink my caffeine and I feel great. Okay? Another one is this chemical called PEA, and I won't even give you the organic structure name of it because it's long and to be honest with you I forgot it. But it's called PEA. <laughs> And this PEA actually does a lot of things. It promotes the serotonin in the body, which is a, is a chemical in the brain that makes you feel nice, relieved, stress relieved, everything just makes you feel all better again. And it also prevents oxidation of that the, the bad cholesterol, LDR or whatever it's called. Okay? Now, you combine serotonin making you feel all happy and, and no stress, and you provide caffeine, accelerated heart rate, 
and usually you're sharing chocolate with people you care about, okay? And, and all those things kind of tied in together and, you know, stuff happens. Now, I didn't give all of you chocolate for anything that, you know, in, in an O tomorrow, so we'll stop. We'll stop there. But nonetheless, chocolate is not an aphrodisiac, but it does is a direct plant product. All right, all responsible from, from plant sex. Uh, cacao walnut brownie. Anything you see with cacao in it has got a punch. Okay, try that. You, you'll you'll head your bet. All right. Mini books. All right, I've got several up here with you with me that I'll share with you. You're welcome to <coughs> and look. Hot plants. Say sex in the garden, sex in the garden, all these other things, and they kind of hit on some of the plant products that we as, as humans have used. And with that, I'll introduce a new term to you, and it basically means I love plants too much. <laughs> have you had your plant gasm today? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. <laughs> At least some bamboos do take decades to, I guess, reach maturity and then flower. I saw a pretty neat show recently that it coincides with some disease. An um, STD? Uh, uh, well, no, <laughs> not 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 a plant disease, but oh. the uh, the mice somehow get the disease and then the communities um, get infected by it because oh. the the rat population just increases uh, significantly. But they flower. The one species will flower across the entire world at the same year. Oh. Think about that one. Yeah. I think these folks want some plants. I guess so. No more questions for Brian? Well, thank you very much, Brian. Thank you all.